Holden, welcome. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Holden. This is Professor Timbit. He's <laughs> helping me this morning to make sure I don't fall asleep. Uh, <laughs> Hello, Professor Timber. West. Hello, Professor. Can I call him Professor? Yeah, yeah. He goes by Professor. Um, okay. His his research area is you know is he's not he's not ready to talk about it just yet. He doesn't want okay. to get scooped. Um, but he has some very exciting papers coming out. I'm sure. Okay, yeah, looking forward to listening to you. Holden, one thing, uh, just remember, remind our audience that you can start sending questions for Holden as, as now, as, as, as from now, because otherwise we yeah. won't have time. Apologies for starting a bit on the, with delay, Holden. So any questions for Holden, please? Uh, where did she get those fantastic uh, bed sheets? It's also allowed. So, <laughs> all yours, Holden. Thank you, thanks. So yeah, I'm going to talk about some of the similarities and differences between Spark, Dask, and Ray. Um, and in doing that, they're, they're all distributed systems. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the principles of distributed systems. Um, so yeah, my pronouns are she or her. Um, that intro was actually already amazing. Uh, the only thing that I, I want to add to that is I also do these code review live streams. Um, and I also do some live programming now and uh, live streamed uh, writing of tech books. Um, and so if you're interested in, in those things, you, you know, definitely check out my, my YouTube. Um, there's, there's a bunch of streams there. Um, I'm also trans, queer, Canadian. Uh, I live in America. Um, I got my green card uh, this year, which is very exciting. Uh, it means it's harder for them to get rid of me. Um, and also part of the leather community. And that's not directly related to these things, but I think it is important for those of us who are building uh, data or ML tools, especially those of us working uh, in open source or in large companies, which can have a really large impact in the world, to look around at our teams and, you know, if everyone's from the same background as us, uh, it's time to try and expand the, the pool of people that we're working with. And um, part of that is talking about where we're all from as well, and our background. So I'm hoping you're all nice people. Uh, you are probably interested in distributed systems if you're here, and if not, that's that's okay too. You know, I'll I'll try and have some pictures of Timbit to distract you, um, if this isn't your cup of tea. So I'm going to talk about distributed systems. I'm going to talk about data parallel distributed systems, and we're going to look at these three systems. We're going to talk about how they're different, um, and then we're also going to talk about some common parts, uh, some of the parts where they're very similar. And we're also gonna talk about some of the mistakes that we've made in building these systems uh, over time. So for those of you who aren't familiar with distributed systems, your life is probably much happier. Um, there's this wonderful quote from Leslie Lamport, uh, a distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. Um, and I think as, as someone who works on, on Spark, you know, we, we do a lot of work to try and make it so that that's not the case, but at the end of the day, there are still times when the failure, maybe not of a computer anymore, but at the very least, the failure of a rack could very easily uh, cause our, our system to become unusable. Um, so why do people use distributed systems? Scale, um, generally speaking, if your data fits in memory on a computer, that's a lot better. It's, it's much less work. Uh, you can solve problems by throwing money at it. Relatedly, the follow-up one is, it turns out buying a lot of memory in a single computer, um, like, yeah, you can buy huge, huge amounts of memory in a single computer, but then computer starts to get really, really expensive. Um, and the last one is a bit of a joke, but not completely. Um, distributed systems also make traditionally simple problems really challenging to solve. Um, and I know for me that that's part of the appeal. And from a business point of view, like this is terrible. Um, but from a like engineering point of view, it means that all of these problems that are kind of boring become interesting again. Um, and I think, I think that's neat. So what are, what are the core building blocks that all of these different distributed systems uh, build on top of? So there's distributed locks, distributed clocks, distributed counters. Um, and pretty much, you know, every sort of fundamental computer science thing, a distributed version of X for all in X. But locks, clocks, and counters are, are sort of some of the key building blocks that they all depend on. And while I'm just talking about data parallel systems today, um, like Dask, 
uh, Ray and Spark, it's important to know that there are other kinds of distributed system problems. Uh, file storage systems, if you've used HDFS or S3, um, those things tend to be distributed systems. MinIO can be, uh, can be not. Um, if you've run folding at home or uh, the distributed.net RC5 challenge, um, those things tend to be embarrassingly parallel uh, with minimal or no coordination between the nodes. Um, those problems are really fun. Um, and they're really nice because they don't involve a lot of communication between computers. And communication between computers, just like with humans, is where things break. Um, databases, not all databases are distributed, but Cassandra is a good example of a distributed database. API servers are also you know, distributed systems frequently these days. We, we tend to have multiple API endpoints and put them behind a load balancer. Um, and for the most part, data parallel systems, which we show where I work, let us ignore a whole bunch of problems that we have to deal with in all of these other ones, right? File storage systems, super, super painful to write. Um, but data parallel systems, eh, not, not as bad. So to a degree um, in data parallel systems, we get to ignore time and ordering of events. And this is pretty awesome. Um, the notable exception is when people insist on making streaming systems, which is unfortunately increasingly popular. Uh, to a degree, we get to avoid network partitions, um, not because they don't happen, just because we dedicate the, the winning partition is whichever partition happens to have the head node on, and that's very, very easy. Uh, multiple clients, generally speaking, we don't allow multiple clients, so it's a lot easier when you have a single client. Uh, leader elections, we generally aesthetically assign a leader, so there's no election. Um, and we tend to ignore this failure of a keynote thing. And this lets us get away with all kinds of problems um, because we can essentially just take a distributed system problem and say, you know what, we're just going to solve it on just one computer and we're going to make that computer responsible for it. Um, and you know that's really cool. Um, the downside is, of course, if that node fails, everything breaks. But you know it's it's not too bad. We get to skip a whole bunch of problems. But there's there's some downsides to this. Um, we'll we'll get back to those. So what's what's left when we when we skip all of those problems? Uh, dividing and coordinating the work, reliability on machine failure besides the key node, um, and the times we allow state. So while we get to ignore state to a large degree. Um, training machine learning models uh, tends to involve like building up a bunch of state. You're, you're building up this uh, collection of parameters that represent your model. Um, transactions sort of matter, and this comes from even without streaming, we tend to need to do things like speculative execution. Um, and the last one, the last one is the really important one. Uh, bottlenecks on the reliable node, right? So once we've designated this key node, the problem is engineers are lazy and we tend to put a lot of things on that one key node, but then it turns out that this starts to get really slow and all kinds of sad. So how hard can dividing work be? Um, so if, you, if you're an IC, you might be like, you know what, that doesn't seem like that much work. But if you have a manager or a PM, you can go and ask them how hard it is to divide the work of your team, and they might have some opinions. Um, but even in computer world, things are really difficult, right? Uh, key skew um, falls into this problem of dividing work, because frequently we try and partition by keys. And so the key skew here uh, it really gets us non-uniform processing times. Uh, so stragglers, um, which if you've, if you've been using Spark, you're probably well aware of. And pretty much any variant of trying to coordinate uh, and split up work is actually really hard. You know, it sounds really easy until you try and do it. And then life just gets all kind of painful. Then there's the fault tolerance. Like, how are we going to handle losing a node? Um, and different people have different approaches. Um, so Hadoop MapReduce um, solves this reliability problem by just saying, you know what, none of my workers are reliable. I'm just going to save the data out to the Hadoop file system, and that's going to replicate it across a bunch of computers. And 
then it doesn't matter if my computer fails because there's a replication of it somewhere else and I can just go and read it from there. Uh, Recompute on failure is the approach taken by Spark uh, and Dask. And to a limited degree, Ray, and we'll, we'll talk about that more later, um, but it requires that we keep track of how to recompute data. Um, and it also really breaks down when we're updating state because when we go to recompute the data, we might update the state more than once. Um, and also it gets really annoying if our failures become correlated. Uh, historically, recompute on failure was really good because failures of computers, they weren't not like dependent, they, they were semi-independent, I would say, uh, but with more and more people moving to the cloud, uh, they've become a lot more correlated as people run on things like spot instances or preemptible instances. Um, the other one, you know, math and extra computers, like that's, that's the Paxos approach. Um, and this is really hard. It tends to be the most reliable approach. And we tend to not do it very much because it's also really slow. And the last one is ignore it. Um, you will be surprised how often that's the approach that people implicitly end up choosing. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little more. Um, actually, I'll talk about it now. So, and Ray uh, in, its, in its early versions actually took the ignore it approach um, to failure for anything involving state. Um, and that's not great. That means that if your if your actor, which is how Ray represents state, was scheduling a node that failed, it would just fail, and your application would just stop working. And you are responsible for managing that and recovering from that. And in the newer versions of Ray, they've added um, framework to to use. Actually, it, it doesn't have a strong opinion on which one of these techniques it, it uses to recover from failure. It's up to you to pick which one, but they have a framework that, that lets you implement the recovery logic a little bit less painfully. So why do we have to care about state? Um, so even if we're doing stateless transformations, there is some state, like how far have we come along, which records have we processed. Um, generally, at the end of the day, right, like, as much as people love functional programming, we want to do something with our data. We want to write it out, and that's kind of kind of state. Um, we can think of this as has Timbit had a bath this month? I think he has. Um, but keeping track of that is, you know, that state, the state of Timbit. Has he has he had a bath? Once we add state, things start to go to hell. Um, using specialized systems is often how we deal with it. Um, in Spark, we mostly deal with it by shoving all of our state onto that one reliable node, but at the cost of just being really, really slow. Um, so there's some options here to handle that failure of the key node. Um, and generally speaking, I would say I don't see this done very successfully most of the time. Uh, normally, what people do is they just restart the job on the failure of the keynote. Um, normally, people use something like Zookeeper um, to keep track of, of everything, and that's the Spark High Availability mode. Uh, but restarting the jobs is, is non-trivial, and so this is like the magic hand wave, but it's about as easy as convincing Professor Timbit to shake your paw without any treats. Uh, sorry, shake his paw with your hand. Um, so what about bottlenecks? Um, so Spark and Dask both fall into this situation of having a central scheduler. And that's really great in that it lets us make all kinds of smart decisions because all of the scheduling logic is happening in one place and we can do all kinds of things like caching and stuff like that inside of our scheduler. Uh, the downside, is that if we have thousands and thousands of nodes uh, and we're trying to schedule so many tasks, that scheduler can get, get overwhelmed. Um, the other one is in Spark, uh, we put all of this state on that one node. And so that, that one node is just very, very busy. Um, and that's, that's not great, right? In a distributed system, you really don't want one node to be busier than the rest. That's, that's the sign that you aren't doing a good job of splitting up your work. Um, and then the transactions one, 
Uh, so this one's important for speculative execution, even if we're just considering uh, traditional data parallel systems, uh, it's like non-streaming. Um, and this is because we generally have multiple writers, but we have one committer uh, who is responsible for deciding like, hey, am I done processing this? Move it, like mark it as done so that the next job can know that this data is done and ready. Although it turns out that the approach that we, we take uh, which came from HDFS, uh, which involved renaming files to indicate that everything was ready. Uh, not all file systems support atomic renames. And uh, it's really important that these operations be atomic. Otherwise, you know, you don't really have transactions. If it's not atomic, uh, you can get like these partial views and that's, that's really bad. Um, and the solution to this is to put another system on top of the non-atomic system that then gives you an atomic view over top of it, which is the approach taken with S3A. Uh, it's kind of weird, but it's okay. So we've talked a lot about sort of the core building blocks um, of these systems and a little bit about their differences, but what are, what are some more of the differences? I think a really important one is the APIs expose. Um, and this is really important. Spark just exposes high level APIs. Um, it really doesn't let you schedule raw tasks. It's very much focused on data parallel systems only. Um, another one is this unit of scheduling work and this task overhead, right? So essentially we can think of this as like your manager talking to you. Um, if it takes them five minutes to tell you about a task, versus it takes them 10 seconds to tell you about a task, um, they're probably gonna be comfortable delegating different things to you. Um, and so that, that task scheduling overhead applies to computers as well. And that approach to node loss, right? We could think about like how we handle it when our coworker quits. Um, and similarly in Spark, it's, and ask and ring, it's how do we handle it when one of my computers die? Um, and another one that's really important that I think we often overlook uh, because we're technologists is what is the community around these tools like? Um, so more concretely, uh, Ray has probably the best approach to the distributed state of, of these three. Um, strangely enough, it doesn't support the standard example that we're all used to of uh, word count um, because it doesn't, um, it doesn't have shuffle. Of course, there's an asterisk there. You can make word count work, but it's just really, really painful. Um, you, you normally end up running Dask on top of Ray at that point. Uh, and it's built in C++ um, and it has Python and Java APIs. And by default, Ray is less tolerant, uh, less fault tolerant that is. Um, and that's, that's okay. Uh, you can change these configurations to make Ray behave more like Dask or Spark from a regards to fault tolerance. Uh, handling the state is more than just a configuration change though. So you'll, you'll have to write some code to handle your actor recovery. Um, Dask is notable for having really kick-ass Pandas APIs. It probably has some of the best Python integrations out there. And it also has these really wonderful low-level Python APIs. Ray also has low-level APIs, but they tend to be implemented in C++. And that's, that's great for performance, but not as great for getting people to use them because um, they can be a little bit more complicated for people to figure out what's going on. Um, Spark is, is sort of the one that we're all used to, I would say, or at least it's the one that I'm most used to. It has really only high-level APIs. Um, and that's, that's not a bad thing, right? These high-level APIs mean that Spark is able to take a much more aggressive approach to uh, fault tolerance. Uh, it's able to do a lot of really cool things with optimization, but it does mean that you can't schedule raw tasks in the same way. It's built in Java. And it has APIs for, I would say, probably the most languages. Um, Python is built in, R is built in, but then there's also a whole bunch of APIs for different languages that come from the broader community, uh, like C Sharp. Um, it does have a new Pandas-like API. It's not as feature complete as Dask's. Um, it does also have more overhead. Uh, Ray probably has the lowest per task overhead. Dask is in the middle and Spark is at the high end. And what that means is like in Spark, for it to make sense for us to be using Spark, we need to be able to split up our work into sort of like 
moderate size chunks. Uh, and in Ray, we could use much smaller size chunks. And in Ray, somewhere in between. Um, and the last one is, of course, the Hadoop ecosystem. Um, if you are working at a place which has you know, a big data stack, Spark does a much better job of integrating with the rest of the tools like Impala um, and things like that in the Hadoop ecosystem, um, your catalog, all those things. That Ray and Dask, you know, they can they can talk to Hive, of course, but they don't understand the Hive catalog in the same way that Spark does. Okay, and we are still running a little over time, so I'm very sorry about that. Um, but one of the things that I want to talk about, and this is because it's it's come up recently, is there is there's a lot of conversation around benchmarks, um, and this is because, well, one of the vendors um, is. It, let's just say they're, they're trying to illustrate that they're, they're still relevant uh, by benchmarks. Um, and I think benchmarks definitely have their place, right? Um, I think it's very, very reasonable to do benchmarking. On the other hand, I think that Dask and Ray and Spark all perform pretty well at the medium size scale of data. Um, and if you're at the like petabyte plus scale of data, I think it's really important to not just take one of the like industry benchmarks like TPCDS, um, you should probably make your own benchmarks uh, that are related to your use case um, because like TPCDS is a lovely synthetic benchmark, but it may not represent very well what it is that you're trying to do. Um, and I think, I think really for most of us, probably the thing to do is to pick the one which is best suited to our domain and our team, right? Like, if you've got a mixture of Java and Scala and Python programmers, you know, Spark looks pretty appealing because they can all work together. Um, on the other hand, if you've got some amazing kick-ass data scientists who just like came here to chew bubblegum and use pandas and they're all out of bubblegum, uh, you know, Dask has probably the best distributed pandas API of any of your options, right? Um, of course, you know, if you want to look at benchmarks, that's cool. I'm not going to go into benchmarks uh, because I think that, um, well, pretty much you can always make a benchmark say what you want to say, and it's just, it's not worth it um, to me. So we're, we're going to skip this, but sort of preemptive. So on that note, um, I am three minutes over. I'm very sorry about that. I am working on some new books, um, namely Scaling Python with Ray, Scaling Python with Dask, and Distributed Computing for Kids. That one's in Spark. Um, and if you're interested in being an early reader or your kids are interested in being an early reader for any of those books, please DM me on Twitter. It's just my name, Holden Caro, or email me. It's just holden.caro at gmail.com. And let me know that you're interested in seeing uh, early drafts of this stuff. And I would love to share it with you and uh, get your feedback. Another one is I really like all of these things are open source. I think uh, the community is, of course, a little bit different. Um, I've contributed to, to all of these projects. Um, and if you're interested in getting involved with any of these projects, definitely please feel free to reach out or just try getting involved. You know, I think they're, they're great projects. And I think that one of the ways that we can make sure that our, our voices are heard is by contributing to our, our open source tools that we're using. Um, and I'll be doing more open source live streams if anyone you know, wants to come and, and watch and get an idea of what it's like to contribute to these projects in the open source space. Um, so I'm hoping that we might have enough time for, for a question. I know, I know we are five minutes over though. Uh, so feel free to shoot me an email with your questions um, and I will, I will do my best to answer them. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, Holden. Uh, that was fantastic. Uh, first of all, what does uh, Mr. Professor Timber uh, think about all this? Where is he? So Professor Timber, he's he's got a mixed view, I would say. Um, he does really like uh, the Dask people the most, I would say. Um, I think that's mostly because they talk to him when we're talking on video together. Um, the other people don't talk to Professor Timbit as much. He's, okay. he's very engaged in, in the research, of course. Okay, well, th there's a question for him, just one. So uh, just one for him, and we don't have time for more. But if you could answer on his behalf, because we don't see him. So uh, 
Oh uh, yeah, he went back to sleep. It's, it's okay, a very busy we'll just day. Just transmitted to him. Uh, we say this is clearly not a, a, a case of one size fits all. So in order to choose the right framework, which you obviously explain a few of the differences, somebody says, is the option having a data science infra infrastructure flexible enough to allow for a mix and match, mix and match approach? Yeah, so I, I think what Professor Timbit would say here is that that's definitely an option. Um, I think with with Kubernetes, um, it's it's quite possible to have a mix and match approach, and I think it's it's very solid. Uh, the downside is um, it's it's a little bit more painful to to maintain from a systems point of view, right? Um, if you can convince people to pick two of the three, uh, your life will probably be a bit easier um, <laughs> than trying to support all three of them. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. In case of doubt, uh, people can email you. You said the best way to contact yes. is through Twitter, DM, or yeah. to uh, or through your well, obviously watch your um, your YouTube uh, streams. But in order yeah, to ask you any, DM. any questions about which framework to to use or which two to use. In case of only, could, we can only choose two to DM you on Twitter, or um, if we have any questions on your new books coming out. Uh, yes, yeah, that, tr that true? Any books coming out, we e email you. Uh, well, congratulations on that green card, by the way. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Professor Timber as, as well, does he go in the package? With you? Yes, he's he's included. He's okay, included. that's great. Yes. He's a lucky he's a lucky man, or he's a man or a girl or a boy or a professor. He's a lucky professor. professor. <laughs> yes, yes. Holding, thank you so much uh, for your talk. Mm. Uh, I'm sure people will contact you me. directly. We hope to see you uh, again. You know, you're very much loved in uh, Big Things Conference. So um, I really appreciate it, and and thank you, thank you for the well wishes. The the one year that I got in the in the motorcycle crash, it was <laughs> it was very very kind. You're very very much loved, uh, Holden. So we hope to see you, um, Professor Timber, next year, if not before that. So in the meantime. <laughs> We DM you for whatever we may need. Lots of love and uh, see you very soon. Thank you so much. See you soon.